Hey heroes, welcome to On Scene First. I'm your host, Tracy Eldridge. With over 25 years in public safety, I am wicked excited and honored to bring you entertaining, educational, and empowering conversations with public safety difference makers who are harnessing the power of -of out-of-the-box thinking when it comes to using the latest and greatest must-have technology tools, a people-first leadership approach, and mental health resources to save lives on both sides of the call. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the first episode that we've had in a little while. Um, I I explained that I I needed to take a little bit of a hiatus, but uh, we are back and I am super excited to have my first guest uh, after my little hiatus, which is a dear friend of mine. Uh, I'll get into kind of how we met in just a little bit, but I just want to first say welcome to Monica Million. How are you, my friend? I'm great. And thank you so much, Tracy, for having me. And I really do hope you touch on our history because I love that we have a shared recovering director. We do. We do. And I am I am 100 percent a firm believer in every person that crosses our path is is meant to be there. And I'll just I'll just jump right in when I when I walked out of my 911 center in in late 2016 not knowing what I was going to be doing at rapid SOS, not having any clue about what this is. And I, and it was so funny because if folks have heard me speak before, they know that I wasn't a huge fan of what rapid SOS was doing in the beginning stages, but very pleased with, with the result of, of what happened now. And so one of the first places I went was Colorado and you were one of the first folks that I had the pleasure of meeting during during that time. And and we'll get into that later, but I don't think there's too many people in the 9-1 space that don't know who you are, but why don't we start off with who was Monica Million when she walked into the public safety space? And then let's, let's kind of go through a little bit of that history, the roles you played, what you've contributed, and then where you are today. And we'll jump into a few awesome conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, uh, I stumbled into this profession. As Uh, many do. (laughs) Yeah. And isn't it funny? My grandfather was a firefighter with LA County Fire. My husband and I, my late husband and I had relocated to uh, Western Colorado, Grand Junction. And there weren't any manufacturing jobs because my entire work history prior to that point was in aircraft manufacturing. Uh, So we move, we relocate. And I'm like, well, I'm going to throw my hat in this dispatcher thing and see what that is all about. Hired in as a dispatcher in uh, at the Grand Junction Regional Communications Center. Worked there, passed training. Then I became a training officer like many of us want to do and uh, promoted up to a supervisor for a couple of years. Uh, went to my first NINA TDC ODC, which is what the S standards and best practice was called back in the day. Oh, wow. And I really got... That was, it was the year after Katrina and there were so many um, documents that were being authored regarding operational standards surrounding um, evacuating your 911 center because of lessons learned from Katrina. And I, and I actually had the privilege of working on the first uh, TERT standard uh, during that conference, which was- Yeah, it's unbelievable. Um, I worked my way up in Grand Junction. I ended up managing the center for just about uh, eight years. Uh, I retired from the city. My husband's health was failing and uh, wanted to stay at home, work from home job. Uh, the state level role had uh, been vacated by our good friend, Bruce Romero. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I took that uh, role as the executive director for the Colorado 91 Resource Center. Did that for a few years where I met uh, my good friend, former boss, John Persano, Mm -hmm. who called me in October of 2020 and said, hey, Monica, you're not going to believe what I'm doing. And I'm like, I have no clue (laughs) what you're doing, you crazy Marine. (laughs) And uh, he said he'd been hired by AWS to start up the 911 team. And he asked me if he was able to build a team out, if I would want to join him. And I said, I'd be happy to look at the opportunity when it presents itself. Um, really knowing that my time on 
and during all of those last really five years in the public sector, I served on the Nina board of directors. Yep. And I kind of knew my experience in the public sector was finishing out, so to speak. I needed to learn something new. I wanted to be challenged. And uh, AWS provided that opportunity for me. So I uh, worked there for whew, 20 months is all. And uh, then become part of the corporate layoff. And here I am today, stood up my consulting business back up, which I had actually started in 2019. A million consulting services. And here I am. I love it. I love, I love all of it. Um, and you did so many amazing things and, and I know that, you know, how I feel about you and what, and what you've done, uh, for this industry. But it, for me also, you know, when I, when I came into this 911 space, outside of my little, little 911 center in Rochester, Massachusetts. Um, never would I have imagined the magnitude of the people that I was going to meet and be a part of, you know, big things, doing, yes. doing big things. And, you know, you were definitely one of the folks that, that I looked up to in the industry and saw you doing amazing things. But I don't, th I don't know if in the moment when we're doing amazing things, if we realize that we're doing those amazing things. And I want to go back to something uh, that you touched on when you went from the Colorado Resource Center to AWS is you said you felt like it was time to, you know, to, to, to move on. Where do you think that was coming from? Was it, you know, that you wanted to create something new, you wanted to be a part of something bigger. It was just, I, I just want to know the mindset because there's, and the reason why I'm asking is there's so many folks out there that are quote, looking for a sign that yeah. it's time to move on. So I love to ask folks that have made that significant leap. What, what was it that made you go? Yeah, I think it's time. You know, one of the things that I have tried to foster is that recognizing myself when I've done all the good I can do at a place um, I think sometimes we get in our own way and yes. allowing the next um, evolution of leadership to step in. Uh, I had been doing that job for about three years. Um, and while that doesn't seem like a long time in my role as the operations manager in Grand Junction, I played a, a pivotal role here in Colorado as far as leading legislative efforts and I really understood what that state level role was doing. So while I got to finally do it, I wasn't offering anything new, so to yeah. speak. I didn't have a new perspective. And I could also see from a techno technology, as all of my friends and acquaintances know, is my biggest challenge in my entire life. Um, and I could also see that there, there is an evolution getting ready to happen in our space. Yeah. From, and it, ha it absolutely has to happen. Um, and that's to modernize the 911 system. And I, I really wanted to be a part of what that could look like and challenge myself. You know, I'm, I've been two fantastic careers. I'm of an age that I want to make sure that everything I'm doing is giving back to the things that are really important to me. So that required me to learn new technology yeah. and what that meant and what, what it could do to revolutionize our business model in 911. And I think that's amazing. And if I go back to my story for a second is I hated technology also, but I didn't really want to have that open mind of the change. Now I'm things are very different. Like now I'm very much for change in a couple of different ways. If, if it's a change that is a technology change that can help the caller, which in turn helps the telecommunicator and mental health, which is another topic that we'll talk about because I know we're both really passionate about that. I do think it's important for folks to have that opportunity to open up their their mindset and look at things a little bit differently and get out of the box. And I think it takes folks like you to to be able to share things in a way that we would see them on a, on a lower level. I think technology yeah. scares folks. I think that it's overwhelming. I mean, when I started at Rapid SOS, Reinhard, my buddy Reinhard, he kept saying CPE. And I'm like, I don't even know what CPE is. Like, what, what is a CPE? <laughs> and then I finally Googled it. It was like customer premise equipment. And I'm like, I should know this. However, I had a state run 911 system and we didn't do the stuff. We just, we just answered the phone. Right. And I think uh, it's so interesting. You, you talk about finding the time that 
you need to make a significant change in your life. The other thing was I felt a little stagnant in my personal growth and development. And I knew I had, you know, in my aerospace experience, I worked for McDonnell Douglas slash Boeing. So huge, big corporate behemoths, right? Um, The hiring processes into some of these um, monstrosities, if you will, is, is pretty, it's pretty hairy. It's pretty significant. And I'm like, you know what? I'm 55 years old. I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to see if I can make it through this process and learn an entire new skill set. because part of the, part of the condition of employment was becoming cloud practitioner certified on their terms. Uh, dude, it was like going back to school all over again. And then, I can't, I can't and even then I had to take it. I had to take an exam, a proctored exam. Uh, and you know, yeah, it's, it's pass or fail. And yeah. if you fail, then see you later, Gator. And I was, I felt so accomplished after having succeeded in both in- <laughs> endeavors. I was like, woo. Rocky, Rocky steps. Cause I just did them in Philadelphia this weekend. Awesome. But yeah, I think Crazy. you have to, you have to be able to do some self-reflection and the longer you're in any career, you have to take a moment to step back and go, okay, where am I at? Am I where I thought I would be in my personal growth and development? Am I really contributing to this team, to this effort, to this cause? And then if you're not, then figure out how to fix that. Well, and I think the thing is too, one of the things that I learned at Rapid SOS that was just not familiar territory with me and and you might feel the same way or might have felt the same way was if something wasn't suiting you any longer, you, you move on. And a lot of times in public safety, like that was not what we were taught. We were taught like you are dedicated and loyal and you give, 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 give. And like, to me, when I would see folks come into the the technology type company, startup company, you know, that were doing amazing things. And then all of a sudden they're like, yep, I'm out. I'm moving over. I'm like, what, what are you doing leaving? Like we're doing big things. And it's like, it's just a different mindset outside of, of the 911 center. Yeah. When you made the decision to embark, cause I know this was something that was challenging for me when I was getting ready to go from the 911 center to rapid SOS is in my mind. And we do this as human nature is what if this doesn't work out? What if, what if, what if it fails? What if I fail? What if I'm not good at this? Did any of that stuff run through your head when you were moving from the true 911 space to AWS, something brand new being built out? Yeah, of course it does. I think, um, if you're not human, uh, then you don't think that, but we all, you know, we're all our worst own worst enemies and our self-talk. And I'm like, nope, I'm going to buckle down. Uh, I have a lot to offer. I'm just going to learn the material and I'm going to be successful no matter what. And, and one of my strengths has always been having a very positive self-talk conversation. Yeah. And it has, it has, uh, worked well for me throughout my entire adult life. And that's good because not a lot of us have that, uh, myself included, is I will talk myself out of things very quickly. And that I think, especially for those of us who have been in a space of helping others, or that's really the intrinsic, that's the driving force in us. As long as I'm helping others, then I can muscle through anything. Yeah. And I think to your point, Tracy, you're of that mindset too. I already know this yeah. about you. Um, so I could see where you would think that that failure would be more catastrophic than failing yourself. Absolutely. It's yeah. like, I'm all right with failure. I'll do it back here in the corner. Nobody will even see it, but it's the point of just knowing that feeling of letting somebody else down. And I think that also gets in help, like helps us get in our own way and not advance. Exactly. Um, there are so many people that I'm seeing put themselves out there, um, getting out of their comfort zone, speaking at conferences. Like uh, I didn't get to go to the National Nina conference this year for the first time in a really long time. And that was a big bummer, but I was celebrating my grandson coming. Um, but watching from a distance, seeing so many folks that are just new into coming out of their shells in the industry. Did you see the same thing? Oh, like, there's yeah. So many it- folks doing amazing things. I, uh, I was able to, as we all have, if we've had any time in the space, we, we see the people and the, the, I hate to use the word younger, but the less tenured folks yeah. coming up through the ranks and to your point, taking those chances. It is so gratifying to see these people stepping out of their space and taking a risk and taking a chance and then just see 
the reward and the happiness on their face when they know they did it and they did it well. And you can just see great things for them yeah. in, the in their futures. And uh, it was no different. I was able to have great conversations with several people who used to work for me <laughs> and to see, and to see, I, I liken it to, these are all my little chickens that are just flown out into the world and they're doing some super fantastic things. And I'm, I could not be more proud. That's, can, that's yeah. amazing. And then, so talk to me a little bit about your consulting services now. And, and I, I'll just throw this out there. And I, I say this all the time is, you know, there's several of us in the industry that are doing very similar things. We all just bring different areas of expertise Absolutely. and passion and just the way things are delivered. And, but at the end of the day, we're all on the same mission. So I would, I don't, I don't look at anybody that's doing something similar as me as a competitor. You are a mission enhancer in yep. my eyes. So I want to hear um, what it is that, that you're doing in the consulting world. What does your new company or your, your, you know, your, your consulting company look like to folks? What can they expect from you in yeah. this endeavor? Thanks. Uh, thanks for that question too, Tracy. I think, you know, initially when I stood it up in 2019, I was really passionate about, there was a vacuum in our space for leadership and succession planning and, you know, under, having organizational leadership uh, being a methodology that an agency uh, managed themselves on. Yeah. And really in 2019, I was headed in that direction. And frankly, um, there are others in the space now, other mission enhancers, I love that term, <laughs> uh, who are doing it very well. Um, and I, that really doesn't, this whole technology um, education that I received has really triggered a different desire in me. And that's really to help modernize the system from a technology space. So what, what I'm offering through my uh, firm is helping you modernize workflows because really we have to start looking at changing operational workflow to really ingest the amount of data that is now available for us to make smarter, more um, efficient decisions with resources. And then how do we help the PSAP ingest that data and utilize it to its um, full potential? And then in the back, you know, from the backroom perspective, how can we help these agencies really be judicious with their use of taxpayer dollars yeah. and not continue to build millions of dollars in servers and infrastructure that frankly, with today's technology, you don't need. The cloud service, the cloud providers do a much better job of cybersecurity, of protecting your network than most agencies are able to do within their own governance structure, meaning their their IT is under their municipal or county government. Um, some of those folks um, are not as well versed in cybersecurity practices or um, network resiliency and reliability practice. And there are just so many good ways to build the system that we need to have to um, serve the public on and that, you know, to provide that technology roadmap, maybe help a PSAP look at or an ECC look at what kind of technology do I have? Did I really buy the right tool to fix the problem that I was trying to solve? Yep. And, and so many of us, Tracy, you know this, we would call our neighboring PSAP director <laughs> and go, hey, what are you using? Because I didn't have the time to go yeah. shop it or learn or research. And I'm like, yo, Tracy, what are you using? is it working for you instead of going what problem was she even trying to solve then i go buy it thinking it's going to solve my problem and it's two totally and different things yeah two totally different things and i think you know helping um our communication centers figure out what that gap is if they did buy a solution it's not working and then how do they how do i give them a roadmap to fix that is it training did they really buy the wrong solution? Is there something that we can do to enhance that functionality to help them maybe not spend more money because frankly, the, the system can't, can't bear it. So, yeah. and, well, and, and, I, and I envision you too, it, like with somebody like me that, so 
like I said, in, in the state of Massachusetts, the state 91 ran everything, but you have folks that are leveling up into the, the director position and they're not a state run entity. And now it is all on them and they have absolutely no idea on, on like what they're supposed to be doing, what they're supposed to be looking for, uh, what they should be checking. And to just know that there's somebody like that, like you out there that they could reach out to. So now my area, which I, which I love is, is, you know, the leadership and the personalities and the morale and the mental health and the wellness stuff. However, um, while that is pretty important, the other side of it is important too. And that's why I think it's great that each of us has our little area of, of expertise and passion. And the fact that you've stepped out into that, cause I'm going to go, I'm going to go back for a minute and I'm going to talk about your ENP study group. Oh yeah. The, the reason why I'm talking about it is because I fell into this new passion that I have in starting an ENP study group, which if, if you looked back even five years ago, if you had said you're going to have a study group and it's going to be successful and you are going to help a lot of people become an ENP by teaching them about technology, I would have been like, you're crazy. You're crazy. <laughs> but like you, I think what sparked me to do that was I wanted something new. I wanted something exciting. I wanted a change and a challenge and the challenge. Right. And, and so you guys, the Colorado resource center, you have videos archived on the website, which I learned a lot of the stuff that I learned from you in those videos and Mark Fletcher and, you know, the, the, the yeah. host of others that, that are on those videos that are still available. So to see where all of that comes, comes full circle is amazing. Isn't it? Do yeah. you think so? What are your thoughts on the ENP stuff these days? Like, what are you, are you seeing? I mean, I'm seeing tons of people get it, which is great. I, I think the beauty is there is a lot of momentum being gained by persons in our profession seeking that certification. And frankly, I think it's very important. Again, I'll go back to the same feeling I had when I had to challenge myself to step into a tech company in the private sector as to, you know what, if I really want to be a contributing leader in this profession, the ENP certification is what I need to get. Yeah. Uh, and like you, Tracy, I was like, goodness, I am not going <laughs> to <learn this." laughs> Exactly. And I was like, oh my gosh. And But I buckled down, I learned it, uh, and I'm better for it. And I think it is so exciting to see so many people pursuing the certification and, and there's think- a lot of there's a what what i'm seeing is there's a lot of frontline telecommunicators yes. that's getting it now and i'm super excited about that because number one it's getting them out of their comfort zone number two it's it's giving them an, an understanding of the equipment that they're working today and number three it's going to give them that extra added step up when it comes time for them to move up Yes, exactly. And and you and I both know, because we've seen it, especially in the last five to 10 years, how many uh, manager and director jobs, the ENP certification is a requirement on yeah. the, on the uh, recruitment process. And yep. I'm like, well, it, you better get it then. If you plan on moving up the ladder, it would be super smart to get it. What types of agencies are you looking to work with? Bigger agencies, smaller agencies, yeah. any agency? Like I'm glad you I'm glad you asked that. Um, you know, obviously working in a big tech company and knowing how, you know, when when you become coin operated in the space, meaning you're driven by sheer revenue. Yeah. You, you know, I could see it at especially at that kind of corporate level. They're driven by going after the big agencies. And my passion is still for the small and medium shops in our yeah. space. They they are they are in so need of any kind of help that they can get. Um, and those those are frankly who I'm trying to reach out to. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not willing to work with others. There's a there's a couple of states um that uh, I've had beginning conversations with that I think would be really interesting fits, um, but they're also not California or New York or Texas yeah. or you know it's not those states because those states have enough infrastructure, they have enough resource, they have enough management of their resources to provide that for their PSAPs so or their ECCs. 
And I, I think fall- sometimes the smaller agencies and the medium sized agencies kind of get lost in the shuffle too. Like Agreed. when I was, when I was, you know, trying to advance technology with, when I was with rapid SOS, when I would come up against somebody who was like a smaller or medium center, um, it seemed like it was more of a challenge to get them to kind of understand the value of it because they're, they were a little bit further behind and that's not to take away from them. It's just sometimes they don't have the ability or the resources to get out there and get to the conferences and yeah. not having the funding. And, you know, when you look at a bigger agency, usually funding isn't, isn't really a challenge for them. Um, but it's more or less like, what are you doing with, with that funding? And are you, are you going out there and getting the info and bringing it back or are you kind of keeping it for yourself? And, yeah. you know, so there's so many different, different reasons, but I love that you're, um, going to, to shoot, to help out those folks. Cause again, yeah. there's a lot of folks out there that are just leveling up and not really knowing what it is that they just got themselves into. <laughs> and, and nor do they know how they fit into their own local and regional scheme do you know what i mean yeah. and i think there's there are so many opportunities to you know procure more wisely um uh having regional solutions uh and the solutions are becoming um more customizable insofar as not everybody has to pick the same thing that's yeah. uh and and the way the technology is advancing uh will enable all of that to that functionality to be realized. You know, the other thing technology is not being leveraged enough for is really to help us with the staffing uh, issues in our space. And I hate to, I, I'm getting tired of the word crisis because it's not, it's our norm. This is the norm. Yeah. It's not a crisis. It has now become the the standard and right. that something has to change there. And I think it's amazing that you said that. And the reason why, because when I look at things, like I was talking to Jim Lake uh, at a conference in Maine a couple of months ago, and he was talking about some AI stuff that they're going to be doing on yep. their business lines. And then like, you know, to me, old Tracy would have been like, what? No, 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 no. Yep. But when you sit down and have a conversation and are actually open to hearing some of these things, like one of the things that I want every agency that I work with I talk about the importance of putting something in place, whether it's it's a committee of a couple of folks or the quality assurance folks. Like there, there's going to be a handful of people in this kind of hierarchy, if you will, that I'm that I'm referring to is we need to know when our folks are taking really, really bad calls. Exactly. Uh, it's it's funny you say that, Tracy. That was my session with uh, my old AWS uh, partner uh, at Nina this year. Is really? Because- um, you can actually use artificial intelligence and machine learning to flag the call either after it's happened or uh, they're working on having it be uh, real time because voice inflection uh, for a decade has been being used to determine somebody's mental um status, if you will. And by that, I mean, in these really large commercial call centers, they've been using this technology to say, oh, that caller sounds particularly pissed off. We're going to automatically route them to the supervisor. Yeah. Well, in a reverse kind of methodology, uh, when I was working at AWS with our AI team is like, look, I want to know that Monica just took six or seven really crappy calls and she is about to lose her crap. Yeah. And and have some kind of window on the supervisor console because, you know, a good majority of our supervisors are still answering calls. They're not separate from the workforce, so to speak. Yep. But like a, I even had it envisioned as a green, yellow, red light thing yeah. that an indicator. Monica's taking her caution. voice. Sounds fine. Caution. You better get her up and, and at least get her out of the room if you can. Give her a break. There needs to, and my passion comes from mental health in our space has been dealt with in a punitive fashion for the last, the entirety of our profession. Agreed. And it's time for that to change. We have to become proactive. We're finally gaining ground on developing wellness programs and peer support uh, teams and mechanisms. But there's still some people who are not using those resources. No, I think as a, I think we have a responsibility as an associate, as an industry 
um, as a leadership group, as a management group, that I need to know that my people are okay. And yeah. if they're not, I have a I have a response. I have a duty to act. Right. I have a responsibility to do something to intervene to help Monica either manage the last stressful calls or maybe there's a pattern. Like we we all know how it goes after we've yeah. been answering phones for years. Man, some weeks it's you it's a complete storm of calls, crap calls. Uh, we used to call it the black angel, black, <laughs> black cloud. Yeah, yeah, yep, we, yep. Each agency has their own um, tag name for that. But uh, and then maybe over 30 days, I finally hit the wall because also I'm dealing with whatever my personal baggage is. Right. Yep. And the two oftentimes don't go together. No. And so I think, again, when we're when we're caring and and being responsible for our people, that is there is tools out there that will do it in. I am hell bent on getting them into our space. And and that like for me that is the epitome of why we're doing what we're doing. we're doing. And I know that we've seen it get better in in even just the last 5 or 6 years. Absolutely. Uh, we have seen huge drives like like you said, but one of the things where we keep coming up short is we well, we just don't have the resources, you know, like Oh, is somebody going to listen to all the calls? And in my mindset is if you were to have, so until the AI is in place, until there's something that can go, Hey, uh, that telecommunicator just took a really bad call. Um, there's certain words. So I, I go back to crisis text line. One yep. of the things that crisis text line does is they take words, keywords, that's it. Keyword keywords. Search. And then they say, well, if these keywords are present, then this could be resulting in an, in an active rescue and things like that. So to me, I, I should be able to pull keywords to say if if there's, you know, this word, this word and this word in that same paragraph and in the same narrative, then this has the potential to, to not sit well and somebody has to check on them. But until then, um, one of the things that I'm recommending in the assessments that I'm doing with centers and the reports that I'm sending back to them is the importance of having you know, different levels of folks that are interested in being a part of this initiative where whether it's a wellness committee or a group or whatever, where you have a frontline telecommunicator that hears their neighbor having a really crappy call. Right. Yep. And, and so I hear it and it's like, all right, now, now it's almost my responsibility. If I hear my coworker having that call to walk over and say, Hey, are you good? I heard you had a a tough call, then it's also my responsibility if I heard it to say to the supervisor, hey, Monica had, you know, just letting you know, you know, keep keep track of it. Monica had a really crappy call tonight. And then maybe tomorrow the supervisor checks in with Monica. Absolutely. And then in quality assurance as well. So we have the quality assurance folks that are hearing the things they're hearing. And Correct. this is why I always say quality assurance needs to be in a reasonable time frame because you can't hear a call and six months later be like, oh, I heard you had a bad call. How are you feeling? Yeah. So Don't there's waste so your, many, yeah. there's so many layers where we can start checking for checking on folks. But I will tell you, I'm sad. I've been doing assessments for a little over a year of 911 centers. And one of the questions that I ask on the assessment is, does the agency care about your mental health? And while there are a handful of folks that will definitely say yes, the numbers are showing that they're not feeling it. So right. whether it's not being perceived or not, I'm seeing lower numbers in my agency is not showing that they care about my mental health and we have to change those numbers. Yeah, we do. We, and, and again, I go back to, we have a duty to act. Yep. You know, if it, we, we talk about um, elevating this career into a profession and getting us responder status and, and doing all of these things. If we can't even take care of the very people we're asking to step up on the line, then boo on us. And, and I love the terminology duty to act. Yes. Um, even as my fellow teammate, I have a duty to act where you're concerned because yep. you're a vital part of my team. Uh, frankly, I just want to be a good human and make sure that I'm taking care of the people around me. And that's helping them recognize when it's time for them to take a step back and take a step back is as easy as getting up and walking down the hall. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it can be that easy and it doesn't Go get mean, some water. Yes. Go yeah. step outside for a minute. And, you know, there's a lot of folks, maybe, maybe Monica and Tracy aren't the best of friends in the 911 space. 
Absolutely. Monica and Tracy sit next to each other. They do the same job. And if Monica's not well and she's calling out, it's going to affect Tracy. So if you want to look at it in the way and how is this going to help me by helping them look at it that way. But at the end of the day, what we don't need to continue seeing is losing folks because we're not reaching in because I will tell you, not everybody is going to reach out. No, exactly. And and again, I just go back to that common phrase I'm using. It's a duty to act. Um, and I'll tell you something else. You know, we talked, I touched on, you know, raising the profession, if you will, raising the career into a profession. This has been a profession. We've just need to, we just need to get the label on it. Yeah. And I think one of the things in talking to folks, especially in the last 10, 15 years, um, I'm going to kind of touch on, uh, the information that Jim Lake was sharing with you, because I know he's actually using uh, one of the AWS IVR solutions. And uh, I've, when I was uh, president of Nina, one of the, one of the initiatives that I started that I continue with today is this inter- international collaboration. The rest of the world has been using IVR uh, and we're not in, in their emergency service spaces because they have the same staffing normal circumstances that we have. So they had to find solutions. And it's interesting to me how some parts of the world seem to be less um, fearful of some of these technological solutions than we are in the US or North America. And when you look at, we we bring these people in, we put a huge amount of training and resources uh, in their hands so that they can be the very best they can be to serve our communities. And then we ask them to answer calls about dog barking and the assessment off assess uh, assessor's office. And, you know, what's my utility bill because government services have retracted so much over the last 10 or 15 years. And the 911 center has become the dumping ground for those services because we're the only government phone number that's open 24 seven. Yep. And, and unfairly those same agencies has not, have not gotten budget or headcount to take on that workload. And so now these highly trained professionals are you are spending time answering what are sometimes tedious questions. I'm not saying that there's still not a necessary need in the community to answer those questions for the citizens, yeah. but there are better alternatives. IVR is one of them. And it becomes a very effective way to remove some of that workload out that tedious um, repetitive, the stuff that the 911 professional was, we are trained to save lives. And, you know, one of the things that I've been talking to a- a agencies about, you know, I remember when that happened in my jurisdiction and I'm like, okay, chief, that's great that I'm going to take these calls from customer service from city hall. Uh, what budget comes with that? And he says, right. none. And I'm like, how about training? None. Uh, okay. So we just have to figure it out. Okay. And then, you know, the next year, uh, our call answer times start, our 911 call answer times are uh, impacted because we're, our same call takers answer the lines no matter what. Yeah. Um, Our, I can't remember the solution, the call handling solution we had, forgive me for that, but you know, the, you could prioritize obviously, but if you're on the phone, then you you had to put them on hold to take the 911 call and blah, 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 blah. And it still impacts the call answer time for the most critical 911 calls. Yep. The chief would ask me, well, Monica, you're always telling me that you're taking all these calls. What are they about? Well, guess what? There's no analytics o- over those 10 digit admin lines, right. but but through an IVR tool, there finally can be, and yeah. you can go back. There's So there's a multitude of ways now that you can see this as a customer service enhancement by absolutely by enabling something like this because you can go back into your city or county administration and go hey trash uh people we're getting 30 calls a week about which color trash cans i'm supposed to put out yeah how about if you put out a public service announcement or yeah or some kind of notice in their billing that tells you know that's a reminder yep. and there's a just a better way to provide some additional information to the citizens that might help reduce some of that but we can't even tell them what that's about because no. the way the 10 digit lines are managed in our infrastructure there's no there's no analytics you could run over the top of it so 
it's it's just uh there's it's a huge opportunity let's just put it that way it is and it's just a matter of the educational piece right Absolutely. it's getting folks to just see it from a different lens i may yeah. look at it as like oh this is going to be a ton of work yeah you know to get this in place but at the end of the day I, I look at those agencies that have been forward thinking and trying new things and yep. advocating for new technology. What we're doing here is going to ultimately contribute to our retention and yep. the wellness of our folks. And yep. it's, it's super exciting. And I am thrilled that you are going to be taking a piece of this on and helping folks understand I hope to see some type of webinar with you and I in the future where we Oh, can, wouldn't that be great? I yeah. would love, love it. To, to be able to get folks to hear your perspective and, and be able to advance for, forward. And I'm super, super excited about that. So we have to wrap up and I'm really sad about that, but I know we're going to be working together on some things. Yep, and Absolutely. And, um, um, but how can folks reach you? Where, where can they find you these days? Yeah. So um, I have a website. It's www.com million m-i-l-l-i-o-n c-s dot com love or, it uh you can find me on linkedin or you can email me at monica at million c-s dot com awesome yeah. well yeah, my friend, thank you tracy appreciate it i, I wish you all the luck in the world. I knew this was where you were going to end up. Just like me, you 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 have to march to the beat of your own drum. That's exactly right. Thank I you. appreciate you, my friend. I appreciate you too. Thank you for taking the time, Tracy. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Hey, heroes. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please like and follow me on my On Scene First social media so you too can keep up with my shenanigans. Remember, stay safe, stay strong, and stay here. We need you.